got a little something special for all the ladies this next week. But I couldn't help but think of some reflections that I've had on what mothers are all about. And I suppose a better title would be just Reflections on, on Motherhood or something akin to that. Let's pray as we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment in time where we can ponder the experiences of some of your word that have had a number of things in their heart they could not help but see. Your hand leading and guiding and directing them. And for that, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. There is not a single person in this room, nor in the city of Weatherford, nor in the state of Oklahoma, the country of the United States, or the world itself, that is here without a woman that spent time bearing that child. Every single one of us. And as I was thinking about this, I said, you know, we men sometimes don't know what's going through a woman's mind during the time that she's pregnant. We share, you know. We do share, you know. You know what I mean? I've never been pregnant. <laughs> What are you trying to tell me, or well, I have. You have. Well, I have kidney stones. Well, I tell you, that makes you feel on me. Well, I was thinking about this the other night. Uh, several things hit me that I hadn't really carefully thought about before. You know, when a woman first finds out that she's pregnant, she suddenly realizes that she's the vehicle and the mechanism that God has divinely put together for bringing people into the world. Now, I'm sure that as that nine month progresses, that there's all kinds of interesting things that go through her heart. Right? I see Phyllis nodding her head. You know what I mean? And I would like to pick your gals' brains this morning just a little bit, if you don't mind, because there are several things in Scripture that brought me to this point of thinking. Um, Many times when that moment of birth comes, because of the circumstances the woman finds herself in, can be either a joy, a burden, or sheer terror. I'm sure that the ladies that got pregnant in Hitler's Germany were terrified that the future held for their children. If the having of that child would expose them and the crying of that child to where if they were hiding, trying to survive, would have been financially, more food needed to be put on the table. It was terrifying. One such example of that, I think, is the story in the Bible of Moses and his mom, Jochebed. Look at the extreme lengths that she went to to preserve the life. She had to have thought that through very carefully, hoping that in some way God would intervene, bring people, the right people together, and the life of a child preserved. I am sure that as she awaited reports from her daughter Miriam, that she was anxiously trying to get updates on what was going on. That's one lady that I was, couldn't help but think of. Um, common, I think, to every woman's experience is the pondering of what that life will be like when it's time to born. And in that pondering moment, you know, she's thinking it and her husband, you know, if they're together and close and all, uh, what the name is going to be. You know, I think that thought is given to that person's name to where they're hoping that somehow that offspring will catch the vision of what even that name means and help them, guiding them in their life, right? Um, other women have had challenges in their life. We take a look at Hannah. And, uh, in, the, in the Bible and found um, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. In that particular a story, the 
mother, uh, later came to be the mother of, of Samuel's experiences recorded there. Notice how, how it goes. Chapter 1. This man by the name of Elkanah had two wives. And that's verse 2. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And it proceeds to tell the story how he would go to Jerusalem to worship and everything. And every time he went, his second wife, Nina, would mock Hannah. And in those days, if a woman was childless and everything, it was actually a statement of shame. She found her worth in motherhood. Uh, to make a long story short, she goes to the temple, she prays, she's father was being drugged by the high priest there and everything. She persuades him he's not. And then when it's finally told, when Eli, who is the priest, responds in verse 17, he says, she, she, she spoke to him of her grief. She answered and said, go, he answered and said, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant you petition, but you have asked of him, <coughs> excuse me, asked of him. Can you imagine the care, the thoughtful motherhood that ensued as she pondered the fate and the destiny and the direction that that life would go? She really appreciated that child. In this particular instance, she was given indisputable, you know, sense that God was blessing her. And she wanted to return that blessing in faithful mothering, mothering and parenthood. Um, another mother comes to mind and it reflects our scripture reading today in Luke chapter 2 verses 18 and 19 notice what Luke the doctor mentions <clears throat> it really starts about the 15 angels have gone away into heaven after, after having appeared to the shepherds the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. They came with haste, found Mary and Joseph, they belonging in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them according concerning his child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But notice verse 19. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I'm sure she asked the question, what does the Lord have in mind with me? We get that sense in the very interesting response that she gives um, to, the, to the moment that the angel, was, the angel uh, told her that she was pregnant. Uh, notice this song of Mary in chapter 1. This is Luke chapter 1. The angel in verse Let's see. Um, she's had an encounter with Elizabeth, <clears throat> and she, the statement is made in verse 45 Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And notice Mary's response. Beautiful, incredible prayer. Mary said, verse 46, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, is scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, is put down the mighty from their thrones, and exalted the lowly. He has filled the lowly, the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. She said in another place, May it be when the angel told her that she was pregnant. May it be 
be to me according to thy word. Now, all the time that she was pregnant, carrying that child for nine months, what thoughts went through her mind? Was she wondering and pondering what the Lord was trying to do to her and to her child? She was even told the name of the child. His name should be called Jesus. So his name is named before he's born. And in the process of having been named, I'm sure she thought of it long and hard exactly what was going on. Now, you know, you ladies need to see if you can't open our male lines a little bit and help us with this thing. And I dare say that, you know, um, some interesting thoughts go through your mind as you're carrying that child. For nine months, you're having that child and you're, you're carrying it and you're saying to yourself um, several things. Number one, uh, the Lord has blessed me with an aspect of an attribute of himself that is procreation. You know, as the Lord initially formed Adam of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the scripture says that he became a living soul, so she is experiencing another form of that within her own body. You know what I mean? The Lord is gradually knitting, putting together, forming that child that's growing and everything. And she's the vehicle by which it all happens. You know, her health, her nutrition, everything will largely depend and will impinge on the health of her child. You know, counsel has been given regarding that aspect of it all. But she's thinking about this. And you know, if we read it all, and if parents have had several children, they know it's a doubt that the different ones that uh, come from them can have characters and personalities as different as night is from day. Take, take um, uh, Jacob and Esau. You know, how did, how did Jacob get his name? <laughs> I'm sure he was named after he was born because his name means deceiver or supplanter or grasper, you know what I mean? And they were, and, and, and his mom noticed that as he was being born, he was grasping the heel of the, of the, of the firstborn of, of that particular birthing experience. And so she, she mentioned it, him as being the supplanter, the grasper. Interesting. Well, uh, other things come to bear on this. You can take a look at the story of Jeremiah. And to the Lord who Jeremiah in his younger years, before he got into the admission uh, to the cinema, was told by told him of his of his divine mission. In Jeremiah chapter one, notice what it says in verse four. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot, speak, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you to do, you shall speak. Amen. And the Lord had a divine mission before he was even formed in the womb. Did somehow his mom at all grasp the significance of this moment? You know what I mean? This, of course, came as a revelation to Jeremiah in later years, years, yes. But did she see, feel that something was destined to happen? I, I think that sometimes women get premonitions that somehow, you know, that child who was born into the world that has a divine destiny. You know, women are very intuitive. Now, back to you women again, you know, as you're pregnant and realizing you're pregnant and everything, what are the thoughts that go through your mind? I dare say, as I've been thinking about it, that if you had one child or two or three, those thoughts change just a little bit from pregnancy to pregnancy. You know what I mean? 
With the birth of the firstborn, you have to develop a certain expectation of what is going to happen. And so when number two comes along, you say, well, hmm, I, this has happened in such and such a way with number one. I wonder what it's going to be like this time around. You know what I mean? And things can, can turn out differently. Uh, but enough of my talk thoughts here. Um, some of you speak up, you ladies. Uh, tell us what things went through your mind when you were pregnant with David, or with Rhonda, I guess Rhonda's the eldest, right? No, Mike. No. Mike, 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 Mike is just right. Mike is the oldest. I think what went through my mind was, is what is, what sex is it going to be? What sex is it going to be? Is it going to be a girl? Is it going to be a boy? We didn't have ultrasound back then to, to tell us what sex it was going to be and all the stuff like they do now. So it was a, a wonder, how do I prepare for this baby? How do I, uh, I mean, when I don't know the sex, how can I prepare for it? Do I get boys clothes, girls clothes? What do I do? You know, you're kind of, and, and how, what am I going to do to raise this child? The responsibility of raising a kid. Are you wondering at all if you're up to the task? Yes. Maybe joyful and yet terrorized by the prospect that's, that's in right. front of you. That's right. And like, what am I going to do about my work? I mean, I'm, I'm a nurse. I'm, I've got a schedule to meet. Am I going to take off for, for so much time? Or am I going to uh, stay home and, and take care of the baby? Or what am I going to do? You know, there's a lot of planning that goes into a lot, and you think about all those things before you have that baby, you know. I can't help but think the Lord has deliberately given parents that nine months to ponder and figure out and get ready for the birth of that child right. in some way, shape, or form. And your life is going to be totally changed with the birth of that baby. I mean, before it was just the two of you, now it's going to be three. Right. So, you know, how is that going to change the way you're going to function? Are you going to be able to, to carry on the same as you did before? No. Things have totally changed. Your, your world is upside down. And unfortunately, the attitude of the world's thing is thinking has changed too. With all kinds of things available for contraceptives, the ultimate being, you know, the abortion and everything, women will look at it and say, well, hey, this is an intrusion into my life. I don't have the, I, 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 I'm entitled to the right to choose my own reproductive issues and everything, and so I'll just have an abortion if that comes to that. And abortion becomes a method of choice so that you can take on a, on a career, you can pursue your dreams in whatever fashion you want, and it's become even a rallying cry of, of a political party that, you know, anything that deprives a woman of her reproductive rights, you know what I mean, is limiting and, you know, somehow it's just un-American, <laughs> you know what I mean, whatever title or what form that they want to make it. Um, motherhood does come, as you've spoken of it, Phyllis, with a sense of uh, changing one's life, one's direction as a parent. Uh, everything that comes along with that, you know, maybe the change of a career uh, sense that you were going to have, my life will be changed dramatically. And it kind of hits you all at once, you know, that first moment that you detect and understand that you're pregnant, you know, those choices that come. Um, Mary was told when she was informed that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, she must have had a lot of questions in her mind. How in the world could this possibly be? What is the Lord trying to do through me? What are people going to say when they finally find out I'm pregnant? How is it that, you know, I'm unmarried and everything is my life going to fit into a society that frowns incredibly on an unwed mother? What response will I give? 
And then she is also told that a sword would pierce through her soul also. If you fast forward to that moment when she sees that son of hers, that she is nurtured, fostered, and nursed, and everything else hanging on a cross, you know what I mean? What thoughts went through her mind at that point in time? Wow. A lot to have on your plate of, of, of your thoughts. <laughs> a lot. A lot. And yet, she had an attitude that said, Lord, be it unto me according as your word. So, we can't help but, but think of where, where all that went, you know, everything. There was things that were associated with it. Well, today, in today's age, you know, we, we find more and more people wanting to pursue their own course of direction. And with it, you know, ultimately, how does the Lord look at, you know, a pursuit of something other than and the whole experience that God designed and wanted to have built into the women's experiences that uh, brings them joy and fulfillment. Uh, women have a unique perspective on life. It's a, a sense of nurturing, of motherhood. Uh, I think that as your as your women are pregnant, you're you're finding your body growing and changing and everything else for the preparation of that event. And the, the moment will come when it's brought into the world, we have to nurse it, we have to take care of it. Its needs are, you know, widely and strongly uh, declared with the crying of a baby, you know, and everything that goes along with that scenario. Your days become nights, you wish you had more sleep, you sleep when the baby sleeps. If you don't, you pay for it. <laughs> Oh, but having said all that, every single one of us today that are living, myself absolutely included, came as a result of a woman that carried me for nine months. Do we honor and cherish that thought? Do we express, you know, gratitude for it? Fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. That what? Your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. You know, to the wife and the mother in a relationship, in a marriage that has brought children to the world, it's designed by the Lord to be a statement that he has blessed her. We have a duty to honor her and to reflect that in the way that we cherish the women that are that are in our lives. Women's role needs to be elevated. We need to appreciate that the old saying that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. <laughs> um, to Mary, again, as we return to her, it's fascinating that uh, she was told that her baby would be a son born of the highest, you know what I mean? His name would be Jesus or Yeshua as it is in, in, in uh, Hebrew there. Uh, I like that song that says, Mary, don't you know? <laughs> Have you ever pondered the words to that? You know, there are several phrases in that song and the lyrics to that that really strike me. Do you realize, Mary, that, you know, you're, you have a child that's to rule the nations? Do you, do you realize, Mary, that when you Touch that face. When you kiss that face, you're, you're kissing the face of God. Think of it. The reality of that moment must have burst on her thinking in some way. You know, I just, who is this child that I hold in my hands? You know what I mean? This di divinely miraculous birth that I have given birth. Um, of course, the naming of a child we mentioned before as a part of that nine month experience. What shall I call it? What shall I call him or her as the case might be? And you know, Jesus' name was already given to her. Oh, you know why? As she followed that, the development of that child through early childhood. 
through adolescence, through young adulthood. I'm sure she watched him with keen, keen uh, interest. She took her mission seriously. We're told in the desire ladies that, uh, that he learned at his mother's knee. And maybe she was concerned with the corruption that she could see and feel and sense in even the priesthood ministry of that time and took the duties upon herself to make she was sure he was educated accordingly. After all, you know, the uh, experience in the temple when he was 12 years of age told the priests and rabbis, that, where has this child been all this time? You know, he's never been in our in our tutelage and everything, we, we don't know him at all. And yet, look at the profound words coming out of this young person's mouth. Yes, where did all that come from? Where did all that, women, that wisdom come to be? You know, who's Steve, you know, that she learned all this stuff? You know, uh, what an interesting moment. And the Lord created all these moments to make an impact on the people that were there, you know? Uh, he did it for a reason. He wanted to arrest in some um, simple way without creating prejudice the fact that God was at work among his people. Um, another individual, another lady that I would like to take a look at is Sarah, Abraham's wife. Interesting experience. Time goes by. She gets older and older. She's not pregnant yet. She wishes she was. You know, among all the ladies that are there, you know, she has a sense that she, you know, can't claim that uh, call of motherhood. So the Lord stops by, informs her that, you know, she's going to give birth to a child. She laughs. Lord, how in the world can this be? Look, I'm past my childbearing years. You know, how, you know, how, how can you tease me with this information? And the Lord assures her, that within this year, she will give birth to a child. Interesting moment. So the, the response of Sarah is one of skepticism, is one of amazement, I'm sure, uh, wondering what in the world's going to happen to her old body when this suddenly becomes, you know, her body becomes awakened to the, all the happenings, the things that go on to uh, herald the the arrival of a child. Did the attitude in her part change in the course of her, of her carrying that child? I'm sure it did. You know what I mean? Unbelief gave way to certainty. You know, this was a bit, finally, as it came upon her, that pregnancy that was going to happen, and then the realization that in some way, shape, or form, maybe God was trying to give a message out. He's in control of everything in our lives. You know, think of it. Abraham, her husband, had been wandering in, in Canaan for a while, had attended him and erected all these different places where they had been. They had interactions with the uh, powers that be in Egypt and everything. Still, she was childless for the longest time. And finally, you know, as her pregnancy revealed itself, she says, you know, the Lord does keep his promises. Which causes us to ask the question, you know, the Lord comes to us in different ways. <laughs> to suit our personalities, to suit the questions of our mind, to answer the things that, you know, somehow we need to have answered as we fasten that belief and that faith in him. After all, you know, Sarah has mentioned in the eighth chapter as having a faith that is Abraham. Her husband Abraham. Wow, what an experience. Well, another interesting moment to ponder is, is, uh, is Joseph's mother. You know what I mean? Um, let's see, I'm trying to have a senior moment. Joseph's mother was Rachel, right? And interestingly, as Rachel and Leah are observed as mothers, and I understand it took two more women as concubines, you know, the, uh, the home environment was an interesting one. Um, the jealousies were there. Uh, favoritism, of course, was shown to Rachel. 
I'm sure the story is told many times how Laban deceived, <coughs> practiced deception in the marriage of her, of her and her and her sister. And in the process of it all, um, in growing up in that polygamous environment with all those little games and gamemanship and, and prejudice that was shown, uh, Joseph finds himself the child of a favorite wife, the favorite mother. Uh, how did Rachel take it? Did she get resentful at any point along the way? Um, did she come to the state place where she said, Oh, Lord, what a mess I'm in. <laughs> what a mess I'm in. I don't know how it would be to keep four women happy under a circumstance like that. And as we extend that out and everything, the children that were born, particularly to those four women, you know, were, uh, were the establishment of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Oh, what an interesting story. You know, I have a lot of questions to ask when I finally get to heaven. Lord, what were you trying to do through the lives of these patriarchs? I'm sure the Lord will respond. Well, we're trying to work with them through their experience in ways that they can understand. But we're reading about their accounts today in this day and age, you know, several thousand years later. And we're pondering the, the answers to those particular questions. Um, does the Lord have something in mind for us to learn? I'm sure he does. You know what I mean? After all, as we look at scripture, we can read the lives and the attitudes and feelings and the dealings that God has had with his people in ages past. And we need to be asking the question, you know, what is God trying to tell me several hundred and several thousand years later? And in the process of telling me, is he trying to make my, me sensitive to certain things? Particularly as we see the attitudes of the people around us hardening when it comes to the meaning of life itself. You know, I'm shocked, for example, on the abortion issue that they're, they're thinking that a woman doesn't have all of her rights and everything unless she even has the choice to abort and terminate the life of that child, even at the moment of birth. Have we grown that callous to life to where we'd say, well, you know, I've carried this child long enough and everything, and boy, this last two or three weeks, whatever, the last stages of her pregnancy have been have been very, very trying to me, and I just don't know if I can take the, the moment of birth and the, the responsibilities of parenthood. In other words, Lord, I really don't want to be a mother. Or maybe it's the guy, I really don't want to be a father. So we're going to end it right now. All this fantasy thinking that we've had that somehow it'll work out is trying to be more and more difficult every single day. Right? More and more difficult. You have to admire the faith of a Christian woman that you know realizes that she's about to bring life into the world. And she says to the Lord, you know, Lord, help me to be the parent I need to be. It's an entirely different mindset entirely different attitude, entirely different response to it. And yes, you will be inconvenienced. And yes, perhaps there's a surprise. And maybe the pregnancy is a result of, 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 of a desire that has been long harbored there to, to have the children and everything. Whatever the case, the Lord would have us think that somehow the birth of a child could be a choice and a cause of rejoicing. That's right. I'm touched by frequent references that Jesus makes to the kingdom of heaven. He compares it and brings children into the picture to the complaint that the children were just kind of wrecking the atmosphere and environment and the worshipfulness of the proper way to, you know, be in temple precincts and everything. The Lord himself says to them, have you not read the scripture that out of the mouth of babies and sucklings you have, de you have declared praise? You know, the disciples want to send their mothers away, and the children particularly, you know, as they crowd around there and everything. And Jesus said, allow the children to come to me. 
Don't prevent them, for such is the kingdom of God. You know, as I take a look at children surrounding Christ, I find them and imagine them in my own mind crawling on his lap, you know, wondering about, you know, who this is, asking childish questions. Why is it that you have a beard? Pulling on his pulling on his garment. You know what I mean? And how does Christ respond? They're the subjects of his kingdom just as much as these other folk. You know, unless you become like one of these, you shall have no part in the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's a pretty blunt statement. You know, how that must have thrilled the hearts of the mothers that were involved in that particular instance. You know, it suddenly makes all the sleepless nights that care and the anxiety and everything else associated with that pale into insignificance because the one that, you know, they long to have their confidence placed in, the one they have long, I'm sure, to have a conversation with, the one that has been so gentle and has a kind look in his eye, has singled them out and pronounced a blessing on them. That's right. Pronounce the blessing on them. Yes, indeed. I believe that when the Lord finally comes again, there will be children alive at that point in time. How will the angels deal with them? Well, we are told that angels will bear the long departed little infants to their mother's arms, and so those children will have to grow up in heaven. You know? They will be able to look into the face of Jesus himself and say, yes. They connect the dots. They've lived on one side of the equation, maybe, well, they haven't, just briefly as a child and all. But they're saying, wow. I'm here in a very unique way. I've been able to come through the second, the, the interesting moment of the, of the second coming of Christ, and now I have Christ myself for a teacher. So how do we honor and reflect that honor, that moment of cherishing the women in our lives? You know, I know that you ladies are uh, having your own thoughts filled with what it means to be a mother-in-law. I'm sure you've had your moments where you say, I wonder if it's worth it. Other moments where you say, oh, I'm grateful that I've been, I've been able to offend mother. Perhaps there's been pain in your life because of the way your children have gone. Whatever the case, you know, the Lord sees your particular lot, your station in life, the responsibilities that have come to you as something that he himself put into operation a long time ago. And even as we live in a society that can't even figure out what gender they are anymore, it seems, you know, or a man wants to become a woman or a woman wants to become a man, what a crazy sense of of direction this human race is going. <laughs> oh, me. What's going to be the look on their faces and the thoughts in their heart the moment the Lord appears? And, uh, and finally, all the promptings of his Holy Spirit that have been made years and years and years as they've gone by, that has been resisted and rejected and thought to be crazy thinking and everything, suddenly comes to bear in that single moment where the wicked have to look upon their, their creator. Revelation says, they look upon the face of him that sits on the throne, and they say, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. That's gonna, moment's gonna come to every single one of us. Have we been faithful to what God has called us? You know, in the process of it all, you know, do we see God's hand leading and guiding our lives? I have an interesting book in my library at home. Actually, it's in packing right now since we've been living kind of in, a, in an interesting way with our, with our so much of our house and storage. But it's called The Medical Consequences of Loneliness. The Medical Consequences of Loneliness. It basically speaks, and it's, it's, a, it's a book about this thick of studies that they've done, you know, uh, on, on the lives of individuals that they can live and how their mortality is affected by the issue of loneliness. 
And I found some interesting comparisons and differences between the sexes. Generally speaking, men fare much worse than women do. They live shorter lives. They don't have the health that women do. You know, they're not networked with people. They're a sense of alone and adrift. Many times when they're retired, everything, they don't have a sense of, of purpose for living. And yet, what is it? And that's the question behind the whole book. What is it that somehow seems to give women an edge where they live longer, their lives are healthier at the, at the upper ends of their life? And they seem to be much more content. They think that it all comes down to and boils down to the fact that there is, a, there is something in their system that, you know, helps them have that maternal instinct of nourishing. I need to be available to whatever might come that way so that my children will be able to know that I am there for them. That maternal instinct, a sense of preservation. After all, many times when a home is disrupted, the man walks off, whatever, and the woman finds herself suddenly, you know, cast upon the drift of a great big huge sea there, of needing to be provider, needing to be father, needing to be mother, needing to be everything. That's right, everything. And she says, my life has got to go on. Women will take two, three, four, sometimes four jobs to make sure that that child is able to be nourished, taken care of. They might, and some of those jobs are crappy jobs, working long hours, low pay. A lot of women find themselves in that relationship turned to waitresses. It's amazing. They're paid, they're not even paid minimum wage. Are you aware of that? They're not even paid minimum wage. And what do they survive on? Their tips. And somehow their employer justifies the low wage by how much they're going to make when they get those large tips. That's selfish thinking on, their, on his part, or in my book. And that woman is work, working in slave labor wages and everything just so that she can put food on the table many times to make sure that her life, the life of her, of the child that she's been entrusted with, will be able to survive. <coughs> well, women do live longer. They live with less disease than men do and all that because they find that loneliness affects the, the incidences of cancer everything else that comes with it. Women network better than men. You know, they have other friends among their, their, their female cohorts. And as they interact with that, it gives them a sense of fulfillment. <coughs> Women more readily express their feelings and all. That's why they score much higher on verbal test scores and everything, because they're naturally socially oriented and naturally propel their personality in directions where that where that sense of social ability will come out. A lot more than men, men are more of the silent, quiet types, you know. We so we've got to tough it out. We can just tough it out, you know. In the process of toughing it out, they don't realize that they're not being able to get out and socialize more, they're actually they're actually limiting their their longevity. That's right. The medical consequences of loneliness. The Lord knew that we were social creatures. He created us that way. If you read the original account, Eve was created as a helpmeet suitable for him. That's a better translation. Suitable for him. To help give him a sense of purpose. Two can do more than one. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two as they witnessed because he knew that in the, in the help, the weaknesses of one could, could cover and be helped by the, the strengths of the other. Now, it's interesting how God has used that principle in many cases. Are you aware that Martin Luther, as big and fearless and bombastic as he was, in decrying and bombasting the Pope on every occasion, sent Melanchthon? That's right. He sent Melanchthon to temper his experience. Melanchthon was every bit the scholar that Luther was when it came to the study of the original languages and being a professor and everything, but he had a quiet way of doing it. For all the bombasty that Luther, you know, exhibited and everything, like Melanchthon balanced him out. Balanced him out. 
I think that many times if we realize the divine way that people have brought a couple together in marriage and prayed about it and all the things that the Lord said we do in blessing, that, you know, the strengths of the husband are, and, the, and the weaknesses of the wife and the strengths of the wife and the weaknesses of her husband balance each other out. The Lord planned that somehow we will be able to work together to, to, to be together and to, we need to recognize the way the Lord leads and guides in these different, in these directions. The Lord looks forward to the time when he will have us all around his table. That's right, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The family's finally home. You know, with some it's Thanksgiving table, with others it's maybe the Christmas table. Some people celebrate Easter the way it is and everything as a family get together. But the Lord is looking forward to the time when finally in the history of the woe and tribulations and trials that has been brought to the, the people of his creation, his creatures, he's finally got them all under one roof, so to speak. What a moment that will be. And you know, as the Lord pays tribute to the individuals that have really brought so much of that possible, I think he was going to have a special place in his heart for them. I really do. Because he's entrusted them with so much of the responsibility of bringing young ones into the world. Placed within our heart and their very being a maternal instinct. And has fortified it to do things that many times a woman was not prepared to do. So just to preserve that life. You know? The Lord wants to come very close to us in our experience. And may because of the fact that women are marginalized in their in their roles and their thinking today, and you know, if you're just a stay-at-home mom, mom, you're almost under the radar and you're looked upon almost as a second-class citizen in some circles. Lord wouldn't have it that way. Upon her, the abilities that He has given her to nurture and to cherish that child, to educate that child. Lord is trying to tell us something that the uh, society is, is suffering the results of because of this neglect. Every once in a while we see glimmers of hope on the horizon. Women given maternity relief and now the ability to, to take care of that child and all. But many times it's, it's short lived. Yes, the Lord has worked in an amazing way through, through different women. Amazing ways. Every once in a while we hear and see stories that have, have been played out that cause one to wonder. John and Charles Wesley's mom was one of those. I believe the story is correct. And if I'm wrong, you can get on it. But I think their mother had 22 children. 22. He asked the question, how in the world did she pull that off? So you parents that have had one or two children and thought you had your plates full, and you did, I wouldn't want to minimize that for a moment. You know, when you did get discouraged, think of her. <laughs> Another one in our early Adventist history was William Farnsworth. I read the book when I was growing up, William and His 22. And I believe it was from different women because of different marriages that were involved there. But he had 22 children as well. And you say, wow. I think it takes a special grace, a special strength, a special fortitude. I think every day in a very, very intense way, the Lord is saying, you can't do this unless I'm with you in this experience. Unless I'm with you in this experience. Thank the Lord that he has promised to, to come to us. We need to take the promises, to, particularly to these women that have trouble and issues, that wanting to be mothers and weren't, for one reason or another, or for those homes, or whatever the circumstances.
circumstances <clears throat> that our offspring found themselves in. And he wants to try to tell us something. And now what is that message? What is the takeaway from this? I would say cherish what you have. Recognize those that have brought you into this world. Pay tribute to them. Help them to know and understand that you know their lives are worth all those sleepless nights and those those sick bouts with with fate and all it seems like as part of child their childhood experiences. And thank the Lord again and again that He wants to He wants to be a part of your life. It's my understanding that on, this, on the battlefield, when soldiers are brought ready to die, the last plaintive cry is they make are for their mom. <coughs> Why are they turning to their mom? What's happening there? There's something about a mother's love, a mother's concern, a mother's interest in her children that transcends all the pain and agony that comes to one's life and experience, even at the end of life. When the Lord comes again, his face will be the first one that is seen. For many, for a long periods of time, time that they've been in the grave, perhaps <clears throat> even desperately sick, like that man that was blind, or he heals his blindness, the first face he sees is Jesus. What a moment that will be. What a moment that will be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today that we can reflect on the blessings that you've brought into our lives. Forgive us for our callousness, our indifference at times, and even our our ungrateful hearts that we've manifested toward those that have done so much for us. For every mother here and lady that is here as well, may she realize that she has you by her side. Her pres your presence is definitely there. You've made women's hearts many times, most of the time, Lord, the more sensitive of all of us in spiritual things. Do we not forget that? As we realize that, that you're trying to make our lives better as men as we look on the situation, may we do everything we can to encourage the walk that women have. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude our worship this morning with hymn number 334. Come now, fount of every blessing. Here number 334.